Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Baptist Renewal podcast. I'm Matt Emerson, and I'm one of the directors at CBR, and I'm joined by Luke Stamps, who's also one of our directors. And if you don't know, the Center for Baptist Renewal is a group of Orthodox Evangelical Baptists committed to retrieving the great tradition for the renewal of Baptist faith and practice. If you enjoy what you hear today, we invite you to check out our website at centerforbaptistrenewal.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter at, at Baptist Renewal and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Baptist Renewal. And don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends about the podcast, even though we've been pretty uh, tardy on our latest episode. So in today's show, we're trying to finish out our reading challenge for 2021. I think we made it through, uh, let's see, eight books that we suggested and then the fall semester started and Luke, Brandon, Winston, and I all got really busy with class and all the rest of, the, of what goes on in an academic semester. So we're actually going to try to cover the last four elements of our reading challenge. Uh, so we're going to talk about John Calvin's Institutes. We're going to talk about Baptist Confessions of Faith. We're going to talk about Herman Bovink's uh, the Wonderful Works of God or Our Reasonable Faith. And we're going to talk about Karl Barth and uh, especially his uh, first volume on the doctrine of scripture. So buckle up. We got a lot to talk about. Luke, you want to help us get started with those topics? Yeah, so I, I mean, I could kind of do some show and tell here. I have the old uh, older edition of this. Uh, one of the, This is one that we recommended here, uh, Helmut Goldwitzer's uh, selection of the dogmatics, um, you know, which is a nice little compendium, about 250 pages, you know, hit some of the highlights. The church dogmatics obviously were written over a number of years, and it's, you know, a multi-volume set on most people's shelves. I also have an older edition of, of the Bob Inc. book, Our Reasonable Faith, which has been more recently published as The Wonderful Works of God, as you mentioned. Um, and then I have my copy of, of Calvin, um, the the McNeil, uh, the Battles translation edited by McNeil. People often ask wh wh which which uh, translation should we use. There is one that's available online, uh, the Beveridge translation, which is fine if you're looking for a free copy. But the accepted English translation is the Battles translation edited by McNeil. It's in two volumes from Westminster John Knox. And then I actually don't have the Baptist I, I, my Baptist Confessions collection from William Lumpkin. But those are available online as well. Um, it's interesting as you kind of put these four together. We as we wrap up the um, the the year on this, uh, one of these is not like the others, right? As, as we kind of examine these last four, uh, which may be a good place for us to to kind of begin our conversation. We're looking at John Calvin, uh, who is is obviously one of the figures at the fountainhead of the Reformed tradition. Not the first one. I mean, Zwingli comes before Calvin. Calvin's a second generation reformer. Uh, and Calvin wasn't the only reformer who was associated with the reformed tradition either. I mean, sometimes we kind of think about Calvin as kind of the founder of the reformed tradition or of the Presbyterian church or whatever. Uh, and that's actually a mistake. If you read the literature in the post-reformation period, people aren't citing Calvin as if he were the only standard. They're citing a, a host of reformed authors, but certainly Calvin remains influential. Um, in the reform tradition. And then the other two uh, authors that, were, that you mentioned that we've looked at here, Herman Bob Inc. and Karl Barth. Uh, so Bob Inc., a 19th, early 20th century Dutch reformed theologian, and then Bart, uh, a 20th century Swiss reformed theologian. But what about the Baptists? Let me just ask you, Matt. Uh, I, I sort of made some, uh, some hay on, um, on Twitter a while back suggesting that Baptists should not consider themselves reformed, um, although I've kind of walked that back a little bit. It was probably unnecessarily provocative, but I don't know. What do you think? Can can Baptists wear the reformed label? Are there reformed Baptists? I just want to point out that you've just summarized your entire Twitter presence by un <laughs> unnecessarily provocative and then walking it back. So that, that's you on Twitter. Never me, of course. We'll give away my secrets. Right. Um, yeah, so I think we need to be clear on what we mean. Baptists certainly are, and this is, uh, 
important to say Baptists certainly are reformational. So uh, Baptists are, should be situated within the stream of the reformation and they're not some kind of separate separatist group. Uh, that's really sectarian is what I should say. They're not some kind of separate sectarian group that is unrelated or not derived from in, in many ways the the larger movement called the reformation so they are reformational uh, to call them reformed uh, i think is more difficult it, it it makes sense in some ways i mean of course we'll, we'll talk about this in a bit maybe but second london confession of faith is is highly similar to the westminster confession of faith and i mean in obvious ways it differs but um for a lot for a lot of the articles you know it's there's some word for word pieces and stuff like that um, so in that sense, you know, the, the particular Baptists, especially, people often try to refer to them as Reformed. I, I have some trouble with that, and I think this is why you said what you said on Twitter. I have some trouble with that because they don't follow Reformed confessions, Reformed thought, Reformed denominations, with respect to church polity and with respect to the relationship between the church and the state and with respect to baptism, all three of those are the areas where Baptist distinctives reside. So we're not reformed as it relates to pedo baptism. We're not reformed as it relates uh, to local church governance. And we're not reformed as it relates to the relationship between the church and the state. We differ in all three of those areas. So to say that we're reformed, you know, I think a lot of current reformed Baptists are using that term not in a necessarily wrong way, but in a way that's thinking more about what we share in common with the reformed tradition. Whereas, you know, when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking, well, how are we different from the reformed tradition? And it's really in the area of Baptist distinctive. So it's a, it's a tough question. What would you say? Yeah. Yeah, well, one of our, um, that, uh, this was kind of providential, I suppose. One of our heroes and, and really the inspiration for what we do in many ways here at CBR, Timothy George, just days after, <laughs> I, uh, you know, created some controversy on Twitter about saying Baptists are not reformed, uh, published a piece with Desiring God saying that Baptists are reformed, uh, which, you know, made me feel awkward and ashamed. Uh, but actually, everything that that um, that Dr. George wrote in that piece, I would firm uh, that that of course, in 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 some in the broadest sense, of course, Baptists are a part of the Reformed wing of the Reformation, as opposed to say the Lutheran wing of right. the Reformation. Right. Right. So Baptists emerge in um, you know 17th century English Puritan separatist context emerging out of the Church of England, which, you know, is, it, it is itself sort of uh, has a diverse, um, a variety of sources that feed the Church of England, but certainly the Church of England is, is, has, was shaped by the continental reform tradition, um, not exclusively, but, but in large part. Um, and so, and, and the other separatist traditions um, that, that come out of the Church of England, like the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists, also shaped by that Calvinist reformed um, tradition. So in that sense, of course, we are reformed. We're part of the reformed wing, or at least the, 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 the English reformation wing of, of the reformation more broadly. Um, and, and so in, in that sense, yes, we are reformed. And there are some that are more reformed than others, right? I mean, I, I think to point to like the particular Baptists uh, in the 17th century, which kind of have some analog today in people who where the capital R reformed uh, label, they are they are hewing closer to what we might think of as capital R reformed theology in that um, they're espousing something closer to the covenant theology that undergirds um, reformed theology. Uh, so things like um, categories like the covenant of grace, the covenant of works, um, the ongoing validity of the Decalogue, so a Sabbatarian understanding of the Ten Commandments and, and its applicability today. And so in all those ways, like the Second London Baptist Confession, the 1689 Confession is, is mirroring or echoing the Westminster Confession of Reformed 
um, confession. So yeah, there are some who are closer to reformed, um, but it's just kind of a balancing act. Like the terms, the, the term itself is not uh, like some Platonic ideal that fell down from heaven. I mean, I, I get the sense with some Presbyterian reformed uh, authors that, you know, it's almost like this closed system that it can't, that, that the term sort of is, is calcified. It can't take on any other meanings than just the reformed confessions, uh, you know, the three forms of unity or the Westminster standards or whatever. So someone like Scott Clark represents that. Uh, and in some ways I respect that, you know, that kind of, you know, rigid consistency, like reform means those who espouse the reformed confessions. But of course that excludes then uh, people that are sort of left in a kind of no man's land. What about John Owen, who was a congregationalist? What about Jonathan Edwards, who was a congregationalist? What about a John Gill, who's a Baptist? And yet in many other ways are, are echoing, you know, not just Calvinism, but in some sense, reformed theology, in, in, including uh, covenant theology, and in, in John Owen's case, even paedo-baptism. And so um, it just seems like we need uh, maybe a broad definition and a narrow definition, narrowly construed. I mean, this is actually what I argue in my dissertation about John Gill. Um, I include him as a reformed theologian uh, in the broad sense, right? In the broad sense, he's reformed, influenced by uh, Calvinistic soteriology, influenced in some ways by covenant theology, um, but Baptistic in his understanding of, of ecclesiology, the sacraments, and, and church polity. Um, and then there's a narrow, narrower definition that would be the more, you know, kind of consistently, confessionally reformed with a capital R, Presbyterian reformed. So anyway, it, it's kind of nuanced, I think. And, yep. it's, and it's maybe yep. a matter of prudence whether or not we want to wear that label. One thing I would say is I, I think that the five points of Calvinism are not enough um, to right. consider yourself reformed. Uh, again, because, you you know, the, the, the reformed Baptists are espousing more than just the five points of Calvinism. They're also espousing the covenant theology uh, that's associated with doctrine um, of God. Yeah, right. And so there, there's a whole host of other things that that are bound up in, say, the 1689 Confession that are more than just the five points of Calvinism. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that it, it's a matter of prudence whether, whether or not we want to use the label. Um, I mean, the other thing I, I would, I would yeah. say about it is that, you know, you can point to the particular Baptists and their relation to sort of capital R Reformed Confessions. And in, in that sense, you have this kind of derivation from capital R reformed thought, uh, you know, and, and you can tie the, the string that way. The problem is the Baptist tradition has never been exclusively capital R reformed in that kind of way. The general Baptists uh, in, in 17th century Britain were not Calvinists. They weren't five-point Calvinists, but you find within the general Baptist movement still Baptists who are concerned about retaining classical Christian doctrines related to the doctrine of God, related to Christology, even related to things like the church and baptism, even if they differ on polity and mode, they still want to retain the language that's sort of classically Christian and reformational, which is why, you know, in my mind, the term reformed is just so confused these days that, um, to, to tie Baptists to the Reformation, which is what we want to do, they're not some they're, they're not some biblicist sectarian group that just kind of springs out of nowhere. Um, and they're not Anabaptists. They're not Anabaptists. Um, that I think there's it's fair to say there's some Anabaptist influence in certain ways, but it's it's they're not they're not the children of the Anabaptists. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I just I think reformational avoid some of the confusion. And I also think that whether or not this is necessary in everybody's mind, I do think it's helpful for Baptists who are wary about five-point Calvinism to hear the term reformational rather than reformed in what we're trying to communicate about Baptist origins. So what we're trying to say is not Bapt all, all early Baptists automatically were five-point Calvinists. That's not what we mean when we say they were reformed. What we mean is they're drawing on the Calvinian wing of the Reformation, this, these sorts of things. Um, and so is Arminius. 
Yes, right. so is Arminius. That's right. Um, what we are, what we are saying though is that they're reformational. So, uh, I, you know, obviously I want to agree with Dr. George, and I do, but I also am a little bit more comfortable using the, the term reformational than reform, just just for the clarity I think it brings. Yeah, I mean, and, and we I don't know if we talked about it on a previous podcast, but we both really um, appreciated and learned a lot from um, Matthew Bingham's book on uh, the emergence of Baptists from 17th century congregationalism. Right. Um, and kind of showing how, at least in the particular Baptist wing of the Baptist movement, there really is this organic connection to um, reform theology via congregationalism, which came out of the Church of England mm -hmm. um, and influenced by, uh, again, continental reformed tradition. So, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, there's some who I think can, can more accurately wear the label. But one thing that I was trying to point out and saying that we shouldn't use the label is that the Baptist movement has become its own movement with its own unique vision of, mm -hmm. of the Bible, of the Christian life, of the church, of, you know, uh, the implications of the gospel for the church and for society. And so I, I'm, I'm more like saying, let's, let's have a big tent where um, it's not just Calvinists, but also people who might associate less with Calvinism, even in the Southern Baptist Convention, there are people who uh, would very much not want to be associated with Calvinism. Uh, and that's okay, right? Because that's a part of our tradition as well, the general Baptist tradition. Uh, and then also free will Baptists, you know, like our friends at Welsh College that we uh, greatly admire and appreciate the camaraderie we have with free will Baptists, people who are more classically Arminian. Mm -hmm. um, and we would differ with on things like, you know, the perseverance of the saints or, or, or free will or election or whatever. Um, but yeah, they're, they too are Baptists. And even those, like you said, like there is some, um, at least some influence, if not like direct derivation to the Anabaptist tradition as well. We have some overlap uh, in terms of our, our doctrine of the church and of the church's relationship to, to the state that we too can draw on that kind of broader free church tradition, which, you know, encompasses both the Anabaptists and the Baptists. And so basically, I'm just kind of arguing for let's let's stake a claim for something distinctively Baptist, right? Which may draw on Reformed sources, but others as well. Yep. On the on the Anabaptist point, I just want to point out that we. I want to I want to kind of stick on this for a second. We're not derived immediately from Anabaptists. Um, the Baptist movement is not connected to the Anabaptist movement in the same way that it is very clearly connected to the separatist movement. And if you even think about um, the, the sort of progenitor of the general Baptists in, in many ways, John Smith, I mean, John Smith started out as an Anglican and then became a Puritan and then a separatist and then a Baptist. Um, now, he, he became a Baptist in the context of his association with Anabaptists, but even in that instance, his sort of brother in arms, Thomas Helwes, uh, retained what we would consider to be congregationalist uh, in, and credo Baptist kind of commitments, rather than going what, with what Smith did, which was move pretty much to just being an Anabaptist, right? So even, even the connection that we would point out with Anabaptism is first of all, only immediate in the person of John Smith. And second of all, even that, he first came out of the, sep the English separatist movement. So it's not even accurate to say, you know, Smith was just, he, he was just a rough and tumble reform dude, and then he became an Anabaptist. No, that's not correct either. So, you know, there, there's, there's still some confusion about that. And, and I think that the desire to associate us with Anabaptists over English separatists is this desire to disassociate the Baptist movement in any sense from the five points of Calvinism. And I just think that's not an accurate depiction of Baptist origins, even as it relates to Anabaptism. We shouldn't deny that there's some kind of relation, but we also shouldn't strain it in an effort to purge ourselves of some doctrine that we don't like. Right. So I probably just made some people mad with that, but yeah. What else are we doing yeah. here? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that kind of is a good segue to think about these Baptist confessions. Um, 
you know, we we selected a kind of sampling. Um, the second London confession or is sometimes called the 1689 confession. Uh, I think we pointed out on here before that it was actually um, compiled in 1677. Um, it was uh, approved by the General Assembly of the, of the particular Baptists in 1689 um, after um, religious toleration made that possible with the Glorious Revolution and so on. Um, so, you know, it's more accurately the 1677 um, uh, uh, confession, but we don't want anybody to change their tattoos or anything. Um, <laughs> it's, it, 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 you know, it's the second confession that's that's uh, under the rubric, the London Confession. There was a first London um, Confession in 1644. Um, but then the second London, it, it, in, in, in large part, just simply echoes word for word the, the Westminster Confession. Right. Except for those places where it touches upon Baptist ecclesiology and sacramentology and so on. And there are a few other minor changes that are actually really quite interesting. If you, if you take a look at some of the things, some of the language that gets added or cut or adjusted, uh, those are really interesting and a really, really interesting study. Uh, but this this confession obviously becomes very influential on, um, you know, the Baptists who come to America. So the American version of this is known as the Philadelphia Confession. This confession is also influential on the abstract of principles uh, that two of our Southern Baptist seminaries adopted in their charters. Uh, and also on the New Hampshire Confession, which influences the Baptist faith and message. So th this really is, without any question, I think the most influential Baptist confession in the history of the movement. But we've also picked up on the general Baptist Orthodox creed, uh, which was actually actually didn't have a wide usage. It was mainly um, limited uh, to the Midlands uh, um, in England, uh, probably compiled by Thomas Monk, an important general Baptist uh, of the 17th century. And actually the, the, gen the Orthodox creed also echoes uh, a lot of the language from the Westminster Confession and also from the Church of England's Articles of Religion, uh, but then has, has more uh, general Baptist, more Arminian Baptist leanings um, and its distinctives. But it's also a rich confession as well. And then the, the third one that we uh, recommended was uh, so-called Keech's Catechism. I think there's some question as to whether or not Keech, Benjamin Keech, the particular Baptist pastor, uh, there is some question as to whether or not he's the one who actually compiled it, but it too is an echoing of uh, the Westminster Shorter uh, Catechism, uh, one of the other documents that came out of the Westminster Assembly with some Baptist revisions. So anyway, what do you, what do you think? Uh, There's a lot of material there. It covers the whole gamut of theology. What are some things that stand out to you, Matt, in these confessions of faith? Yeah, so what I always want to point out about these early Baptist confessions is that both particular Baptists, so what we would call today Reformed Baptists, and General Baptists, or what you might call free will or Arminian Baptists in early British Baptist life, both of both sets of Baptists were concerned to maintain what you would call what we might call classical Christian orthodoxy and reformational commitments. Um, so especially with respect to First of all, the doctrine of God and, and also Christol the doctrines of God and, and Christology, the, those confessions are pretty much just repetitions of Nicene and Chalcedonian language regarding the Godhead and regarding the person of Jesus. Um, and so the idea that early Baptists are these sort of naive biblicists who just want to go back to me and my Bible and, and write a confession from scratch is just silly. It's ridiculous. Um, and they're also intent on retaining reformational uh, commitments as, as it relates to the doctrines of salvation and the church. So in, in terms of, and I'll get to the church in a second because there's also differences there, but on salvation, it's very clear they're drawing on what's happening in the reformation with, re with respect to justification by faith alone, this sort of thing. On the doctrine of the church, they're also reformational in the sense that they're rejecting papal authority, they're rejecting um, the Roman Catholic ecclesiology. Uh, it doesn't mean, I don't mean by saying there's, you know, they're, they're repeating or, or drawing on reformational ecclesiology. I don't mean that they're repeating it because there's also differences with the other reformed traditions, but in the larger sense of breaking away from 
Roman Catholic ecclesiology, they certainly share commitments about the doctrine of the church there. So I, every, every time I talk about Baptist confessions, I just want to keep pounding the fact that early Baptists were not trying to do something brand new. They were trying to articulate what they believed and why on the basis of scripture and tradition in relation to both broader Christian consensus throughout Christian history and with the reformational movement that was happening uh, in England and elsewhere. So they're, they're just, they're just reformational Christians in one sense. Um, the other thing I would, I would point out that's interesting, and, and you probably want to talk more about this, uh, is that, you know, there's also a unique contribution of Baptist, Baptist thought in these confessions as it relates to the three things I mentioned earlier, credo baptism, local church governance, and the relationship between the church and the state. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and just say all those are related to Baptist commitment to personal responsibility before the Lord. Um, but you may want to say other things about the last one of those, especially the political theology. So I'll, I'll turn it back to you and say, what do you find interesting about these confessions? Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mentioned the Bingham book earlier. Uh, we just, just, we need to plug that again and, and encourage people to read it. It's called Orthodox Radicals by Matthew Bingham. Uh, you know, there's some controversy over his, um, his interpretation of the history, but I think it's, you know, from my perspective it's, it seems largely persuasive that the particular baptists come out of the congregationalist movement right so the congregationalists have already made one of those maneuvers to see the church uh, the local church as comprised of believers uh, who have sort of responsibility before christ for the governance of each local assembly um, and so that's one move that's already made the baptists then saw in that well the logical entailment of that if you're saying that the church is not like a a function of the state, but is to be made up of genuine converts, then why are we admitting into the membership of the church via baptism people who have not yet made a profession of faith, that is the children of believers. And so it was the, the sort of the logical entailments of congregationalism that led the Baptists to embrace um, uh, believers baptism, uh, believers only baptism. Uh, but part of that too is is a political, entails a political or social theory as well that that the church is seen as a, a separate people from the state, uh, that you're not born into the church in the same way that you're born into the state, uh, but that you have to be born again into the church, that it requires uh, a, 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 um, a sort of authenticated uh, work of God's grace in the person's life that's, that's manifested in a voluntary uh, choice to repent and believe in the gospel. Um, and so that's what comprises the church as this separate uh, people. Um, by, by God's grace through free will, uh, the church com comprises a, a, a separate people from the state. And yet, the earliest Baptists, and this is, they're, they're at great pains in these confessions to say they're not Anabaptists, right? I mean, that's actually the, the prologue of the, of the second line, and actually begins there, right? The, the, the people commonly, though falsely, referred to as Anabaptists, right? Uh, so they're trying to say, no, no, we're not Anabaptists, because the Anabaptists, uh, while there is some overlap, the Anabaptists also were withdrawing from society. They refused to participate uh, in civil society. They refused, they, they thought it was inappropriate for a Christian to serve as a Christian, as a, as a civil magistrate. They refused to take civil oaths. And so they were a kind of, with, you know, a withdrawal movement, whereas the early, earliest Baptists were saying, no, the, the state, civil society, um, is a legitimate sphere of God's governance of the world, it's just separate from the church, right? And so it's that, that path of saying Christians can rightly and vigorously participate in civic life uh, with all of our Christian commitments, uh, but that's different than uh, the church. That's, that's something that's, that is separate from uh, the way that God uh, administers his, his rule in the church through the gospel, through the preached word. Um, and in a sense, the, 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 the Baptists are kind of taking the, the two kingdoms theology of the, of, of the Lutheran tradition, it's also as an analog in the Reformed tradition, and, and bringing it to its logical entailments. That what that means then, if, these, if, there, if there are distinct realms of God's rule, uh, then, then they should remain separate. They're, they're, we shouldn't rely upon the civil magistrate 
um, to sort of grease the rails for the church. And this is hugely important in some contemporary conversations that are taking place kind of as we speak, right? Where you have some uh, Christians who are trying to resurrect or to retrieve or recover um, the magisterial reformation view of the church and state. Uh, that that the civil magistrate is 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 there in, in order to, to to serve as a nursing mother, the way the Westminster Confession puts it, uh, of the church, right? Right. So the so the, the civil magistrate has a responsibility to, um, kind of uh, again enforce or or at least to uh, to provide for the flourishing of the church and for the uh, religious life, and in a unique way where the church has got has a kind of privileged status in society. Uh, in the ideal. And Baptists were just saying, no. I mean, you go back to Thomas Elwes, you know, one of the first Baptists, and he says, it does, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, it doesn't matter if, if you're Jewish or if you're Muslim or if you're a pagan, uh, it, the, the, the state cannot dictate to you uh, your religious convictions. And so that principle of religious liberty, but at the same time, not, not a sort of seeding of the civil realm uh, to non-Christian or non-Baptist influences, but at the same time saying, no, Baptist Christians, uh, other Christian groups can, again, vigorously participate in civil society, uh, but it's just to, seen as a, as, a, as a separate manifestation of God's providence and what we have in the church. Yeah, so, you know, Baptist thought is often either portrayed as entirely derivative of some other tradition and then just breaks away in a couple of places and um you know that's it or as this kind of naive biblicist movement that pops out of nowhere and now dominates the world um <laughs> neither neither of those are reality uh that the Baptist movement certainly is related to, uh, derivative from, in some respects, the, the other reformational movements that are taking place. Uh, it's definitely derivative of classical orthodoxy. But at the same time, it has unique contributions to make that aren't simply mistakes. You know, that, that's, that's the kind of uh, portrayal you get about Baptist thought, is that in any way that they differ from the tradition, They've simply made a mistake. And I would just say, even if you disagree with Baptists on these things, um, on the issue of credo baptism or the issue of local church governance or the issue of uh, the relationship between the church and the state, to view Baptist distinctives as entirely mistaken, I think misses an opportunity to see what God is doing among a group of people that he calls his own. Um, it doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but you can see the good in it uh, and, and then try to understand it. For fellow Baptists, our Baptist distinctives are not intended to say that we're some kind of sectarian movement that has no obligation to anybody else in Christianity. Uh, we're actually related to other Christians doctrinally and not just sort of in a vague spiritual sense. We have much in common with the rest of the church. You know, so, so Baptist, you know, the Center for Baptist Renewal, we're talking about Baptist Catholicity. That's what it entails, right? It's saying, here's what we have in common with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's, here's where we differ from our brothers and sisters in Christ, but hope that we can still bring gifts to them, even if they don't agree with us entirely about it right it's sometimes referred to as as receptive ecumenism right where you're sort of seeing what what is it that i can learn from this other tradition and i think certainly uh we've tried to say from the very beginning of our work at cbr we have a lot to learn from from the the broader christian tradition certainly on the cardinal doctrines of the faith uh even even in terms of uh, of the doctrine of the church and of political theory we have a lot to learn from saint augustine and from Thomas Aquinas and from Luther and Calvin, even where we might differ with them on some things, there's still a lot to, to, to appropriate, to appreciate. Uh, and we would hope that others would do the same with the Baptists instead of just seeing it as a, as a, as you said, as a mistake that every, every, every move that we make that might be out of step with 
the consensus in a certain snapshot, right? I mean, again, consensus gets tricky here. If you say, well, you know, sometimes people will say, well, Baptists are denying all of, you know, Christian political theory. Uh, well, there was a church before Christendom, right? There was a there was the 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 church a church before Constantine, um, and I, I you know I'm not here to talk about like the, the Constantinian fall of the church as if nothing good came out of Christendom. I think there's much that we can appreciate, um, you know, civilizationally, culturally that emerged out of Christendom. But at the same time, the church didn't have that in the New Testament. Right. They didn't have that in the first you know three centuries of the church, um, and and we don't need that in order to, to thrive and flourish. The, uh, Christians in other parts of the world don't have that, um, you know, and, and, and places where there's persecution and so on. And that's obviously not ideal, right, that there's persecution. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, imagine if Christendom had been there from the beginning and we don't have the letter of Polycarp or Ignatius's seven letters to the churches or Tertullian's statement that the blood of the martyrs is the seat of the church yeah i mean, I, mean I, I you know I, to to say that um the political position or the, the position of the church on political theology is is christendom or uh some kind of reformed version of christendom i think is mistaken uh you know and i just i my, my struggle with the kind of I don't want to say this that's not overly inflammatory. Uh, the struggle I have with what what I perceive as the kind of dogmatic certainty of some of our reformed brethren outside of Baptist life about their political theology, where we're looking at a new kind of establishmentarianism, is that it seems to be historically, it seems to have historical amnesia. Um, in the sense that, well, in a few different ways. I mean, first of all, you have the wars of religion after the Reformation. Uh, you have, in our own tradition and adjacent traditions like Anabaptism, you have establishmentarianism means credo Baptists are drowned, killed, in other ways, arrested, kept in prison, beaten, uh, up through, you know, the colonial period in America. And there, you know, perhaps there's a conversation to have another time about the dangers of a kind of disestablishmentarianism that draws on John Locke. We, I mean, everybody's talking about the dangers of that. What I don't hear anybody talking about is the actual historically present and, and you, you know, the, the historically present dangers that are presented by establishmentarianism. Go back and look at the history of this and see the violence done to brothers and sisters in Christ. That's serious. And th there's a kind of, I think we need to be uh, cognizant and aware of a kind of naivete that exists about we can, we can produce something else. We can produce an establishmentarianism that doesn't do violence to those who disagree with us. Let's see it happen. <laughs> you know, show me an example. Show me an example of that that has actual teeth. Right. If you point to the Church of England, the Church of England has no teeth in the state of Britain. But when it did, it imprisoned Baptists. Exactly. <laughs> or or kept Baptists and um, and other religions. You know, um, Jewish people out of civic life. Yep. I mean, I I just I don't I do I mean I in some sense I want to. I, I kind of want to call people's bluff on this and say, do you really want to go back to, to that? And, and, and sometimes I'll sort of get a joking uh, response of, yeah, you know, let, let's, let's uh, throw the Baptist in prison or whatever. Um, so I, I, it's, it's either, it's either. Um, I can think of a few people on Twitter who'd like to throw you in prison, but <laughs> it, might, it might not be because you're a Baptist. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but you know, I just, I, it's just kind of, it's puzzling to me uh, that people sort of want to go back to the medieval world or or at least back to the early modern world where you know you had again people in prison for expressing their religious views uh, i don't think that you have to agree with like everything going on in late modern political liberalism 
right. in order to to uh, to see that as a as a problem. Right? Well, I, and I just think about the the New Testament. What's what is the New Testament almost obsessed with in terms of warning us about? It's it's doing violence to our brothers and sisters in Christ. What does it prod us towards with almost an obsession, being willing to die for our faith, right? So, yes, there is a danger in the West right now Right now, that we could go to a kind of mob pagan rule where Christians are imprisoned and put to death for their beliefs. What the New Testament tells us in the face of that is to be willing to go. What it doesn't tell us to do is to go back to a situation where we're putting other Christians in jail for what they believe or not allowing them to follow their conscience within the bounds of Christian orthodoxy. Right. That's not what the New Testament tells us to do. Uh, the other thing I would say is there's a space between Dave Matthews that uh, that wasn't a stupid movie quote. It was a music quote. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a space between establishmentarianism on the one hand and a kind of Lockean disestablishmentarianism on the other hand, and it's called Baptist political theology. If you read early British Baptists on the relationship between the church and the state, it is not a kind of passive laissez-faire view of how Christians should relate to the state or of how the state should enact laws that are in accordance with God's revealed law in his word and in the natural law that exists by virtue of his creation. Like they, they, you know, they're not for this kind of, you know, whatever everybody thinks is best. Right. Yeah. No, no conception of the good, uh, yeah. nothing sub substantial. It's all procedural. Everybody just kind of believes and creates their own meaning. That's right. really right. not, you don't, you don't have to, be an establishmentarian to believe that you can make a case in the public square from the light of of, of nature from reason yeah. that like there is a good life that we want to to lead that, right. that you know that, that the family is important that marriage is important that protecting life is important like uh certain, i mean it's, it's interesting that baptists are sometimes in these conversations being accused as uh, being accused of kind of having this kind of uh quietistic you know view of just let you know let everybody do their own thing baptists have been second to none in, in pushing for the dignity of unborn human life, you know, right. and, and, and issues related to public morality. It's just what, what we're trying to argue is that you don't need a state church. Uh, you don't need to be citing chapter and verse from the Bible in the public square. You can appeal to the light of nature. You can appeal to universally accessible reason. Now, people may not be persuaded by that. If you don't have a shared sense of virtue, cultures may go from bad to worse. Uh, but we don't have, at least the, the New Testament doesn't give us um, the, the right to impose upon society a particular religious view. Here's the other thing I would say. If you the want, church doesn't have that right. Yeah. If, if, you want, if you want to see a society retain or gain a shared moral fabric, it is not through the church relying on the sword of the government to do so but instead it's through the church evangelizing people around them who are converted by the power of the spirit of god that's how you attain or retain or gain a shared moral fabric go evangelize people go share the gospel don't rely on a temporal government to do what only christ can do mm. all right i'm done yeah, and we're out of time. We don't even have time to talk about Calvin or Bob Inc. or Bart. Yeah, we may I, have to come back to another episode or not. Yeah, maybe. Give short stuff, but. maybe. Maybe so. We may we may try to do it over the Christmas break and try to get one more episode out for 2021. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about what, what's coming up, what we want to do next at CBR. I want to make money. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we definitely didn't get into this for the, yeah. for the money. Um, so what we're going to, we're going to try to do another reading challenge in 2022. It will not, I mean, we're going to try to do a podcast. I mean, we did pretty good on the podcast up through like August, I think. Um, we're going to try to do a podcast episode related to the readings. Uh, that list will be released shortly before the new year. 
we are kicking around some ways to try to get some more long form content in front of people. So, uh, you know, of course we have the blog and people contribute to that regularly and we want to keep doing that in, in terms of shorter posts, but we also want a, a way for those who are connected to our community to engage in more long form arguments, footnotes, serious essays, etc. cetera. Um, and so we're, we're looking at ways to do that. And of course we wanna continue on the podcast, our walk through the manifesto that got derailed as we tried to play catch up with some of the reading list episodes, uh, but we do wanna get back into dealing with the manifesto. Anything else you wanna mention? I'm not sure if you mentioned what the reading challenge is, but oh, right. uh, we've settled on the classics of Baptist theology. Um, so we spent this year mainly reading non-Baptists, some, some Baptists as we talked about today, um, but in the new year, we want to do a, a specifically Baptist list. I think that's one thing that we need. We actually need a lot of remedial work in our own tradition um, yeah. to sort of recover what is it the Baptists believe on a whole host of issues, from biblical theology, the church, systematic theology, uh, issues like we talked about today related to, to political theory. So, you know, that's what we're hoping to do. All right. Well, All right. with that, we'll close this out. We might have another episode in 2021. Probably not. Uh, if we don't see you in the new year, thanks for watching and listening. <laughs>